Good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode three, season two of Real Talk. I'm Michelle Lee, your host. And before I bring out our special guests um, this evening, I'd like to take a moment to remember and celebrate the life of Aaron Frosty Foster, who we lost yesterday at the age of 28. He was an extraordinary guitar player a member of the Amanda Cook Band, he and his fellow bandmate and dear friend Troy Boone recently released their single, County Fool, on Mountain Fever Records, which just peaked on the Bluegrass Today charts at number six. He has been a guest on all my shows from the Bluegrass Borderline, the Smoke Country Jam, and Real Talk Bluegrass here on Bluegrass Music TV. So together, myself and Sammy Passamano III created a video to honor Frosty. Frosty. I had the same thing. I, I'm just not gonna. But you, yeah. Frosty. I had the same thing. I, I'm just not gonna take it for granted anymore that when you get to play music, period, even if it's a jam session. You know how many times at, I think now that I was at Spigma where it was like 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. and you're kind of tired. You have one more opportunity to jam and you pass up on it to go take a nap or whatnot. To go back to that time and be like, I would just stay up and play. I would just do it. <laughs> you know, it's like, and that that's kind of like kind of the edge I think that bluegrass is gonna get back. And I I think when these festivals first start safely opening up, like where we can post about it on social media and be like, hey, look what we're doing. Fun, you know, but, without yeah. you know feeling bad about you know being there <laughs> you know yeah. when that happens again it's going to be insane because these people are, are they're all pimped up you know like my grandparents for example they missed their whole summer and at their age you know being retired it's the only thing they look forward to the whole year and you combine that energy with a bunch of fired up musicians that want to play it's going to be nuts <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. I'm going to assume Frosty has nothing to do with it, please. He will not raise his child. <laughs> so far, the test has came back negative. Negative, negative. no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love you just that... me there. <laughs> I love the fact that Frosty's in between the two of you, by the way. I'm um, just pointing yeah. that out. You never know when you have to break these two up. <laughs> He's a well-trained mediator. He knows to take my side whenever it counts, and most of the time take Caroline's side. <laughs> so it wasn't so bad. What are you doing? I'm, I'm replying to, to friends who are making fun of me because I'm, on, I'm like, hey, are you on live? I'm going to send you something funny. Oh, yeah, I, see. <laughs> I see. Yeah, I know for me, the most daring thing was riding back to our hotel after Milan, Michigan. <laughs> And seeing signs that say "Do not enter" and watching the car turn right down the "Do not enter" side, the wrong side of the interstate, get ready to go on. That was probably the most daring. That was probably the most daring thing in my experience. Who was the driver at that time? <laughs> yeah, and then, here's the famous Amanda we're quote. But did you die? I think my yeah. favorite one is from the Penny Royal Opera House. I've oh. got saved on there. I tried to do one of them, you know. <laughs> nice panoramic photos where i can get one side of the stage and get the whole crowd and get the other side well she moved ever so slightly so it just parted her face just enough to where it still looks real but her eyebrows are super wide apart and she's got like she's winking in one and her eyes wide open in the other yeah she, <laughs> her first ibma award i'm gonna have that just like played and streamed across the background <laughs> i think i could go through sushi like Especially and right never now. stop. Yeah, especially right me out. Right me out with some sushi. Yeah, you're not getting sushi. <laughs> I know we're getting sushi. <laughs> Would be the um. I'm the not even wearing deodorant. deodorant right now. <laughs> <laughs> how we are right now is how we are all the time, and you know we all care about what we're doing, and we all care about one another, and we're, we've all got a you know, we've all got a vested interest in the band and everybody does mm -hmm. their part and it's a team. And it's really mm -hmm. that therapy suite, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how about you guys? Do you feel the same or, you know, you're, you know, you're thinking she's just, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you wonder no, about no. her sometimes. For me, it's yeah. definitely like a family thing because, yeah. I mean, we're talking about this pandemic i haven't seen my grandparents or parents since last technically last january christmas break i haven't been home in over a year 
you know? Wow. So without these guys here, you know, uh, it gets kind of lonely. There's lots of, you know, just difference between friends and family. You know, I don't think I could have stayed with someone for a month during a quarantine that wasn't family. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, and here's another thing that bluegrass needs to know about. They need to know about Aaron Ramsey. Yes. Aaron Ramsey is one of the best behind the council, yeah. like sound engineers and musicians, yeah. period. Okay, yeah. the guy's been a freak since the beginning. He's played with Malin Hart. He plays bass, guitar, banjo. He plays it all. If you don't know who Aaron Ramsey is, get to know him, folks. Look he's, it out. he's the real Look deal. Up. And Absolutely. they just and they just had their first kid today. Yeah. yeah. Jovi. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's yeah. a whole thing. Happy for everybody. It's good yeah, stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, we took it yeah. through Raising Canes, Bojangles, Hardys. <laughs> I mean, it's been bluegrass. It's yeah. been, it's ready to go. It's been, yeah. She didn't even hit a curb. Yeah, no, you didn't hit a curb <laughs> or a person. <laughs> or Nothing. Person. <laughs> yeah. What a great guy. What great memories. And now let's make more memories. And in the memory of Aaron Fro Frosty Froster, let's bring on. Darren Nicholson and Dan Eubanks. Uh, Daryl Nicholson, of course, with Boston Range. Dan Eubanks uh, from Special Consensus. Thank you guys for joining <clears throat> us on a, a very emotional day for the world of bluegrass. Um, do you guys have any um, remembrance of seeing Frosty and the, the band out on the road that you could share um, with us, Darren and Dan? We'll go with Darren first. <clears throat> well, uh, I got to meet him a couple of times. I didn't know him personally a lot of times when you're playing bluegrass you kind of you see you see your friends but you don't really get to spend a lot of time with them you know you're kind of coming in loading in and they're loading out and you kind of pass each other and, and say hi um you don't get to hang out uh, i think uh, as much as people think you do but just uh, what a tragedy 28 years old and the guy is full of life and just a good energy you know it's just uh, we hate to see that and where I just want uh, everybody to know I'm thinking about his friends and family, uh, everybody who's uh, suffering that loss right now. It's been a it's been a, a hard year and a half for a lot of people, you know, and and uh, this is just a another thing that uh, it's just, you know we're gonna have to get through. But uh, what a what a great guy! It's great to hear him laughing and sharing stories on there. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Dan? Did you guys uh, with Special C ever run into him on the road? Oh yeah, we we did a, a several shows um, with uh, Dreamcatcher, and um, we would run across the ETSU Pride Band out there once in a while, and uh, you know, Spigma, uh, Jenny Brook, um, just you know, yeah, we crossed paths quite a bit, and. He was just, he was just hilarious. He was just great fun to be around. He could not be in a bad mood if Frosty was in the room. Um, he was, he's just a light. He is an absolute light. And uh, it's, it's a really, really sad story. And I just want to echo what Darren said that we're all thinking hard and praying hard and, and uh, just hoping for, for peace for his family and friends. It's just brutal. So yeah, you know, definitely, he's going to be missed. Definitely a, a loss in, in the bluegrass community. And, uh, you know, one of the things about the community of bluegrass, we always come together and, um, you know, we're there for each other. And one of the, the things that is amazing uh, with the two of you, you both are with uh, two outstanding um, bands that have both uh, taken home some prestigious awards with the International Bluegrass Music Association, along with being nominated for Grammys. Uh, Dan, tell us a little bit, um, of course, about, you know, you, you've been playing music and performing for pretty much your entire life uh, to the point that you, you grew up in uh, Saint, the St. Louis area and you were teaching and, and now you're kind of going back to that. Um, but we'll touch base about your new adventure during this pandemic here in a bit. But, you know, what really got you into uh, performing and performing in bluegrass specifically? Well, um, I started performing just hanging out with my buddies when we were dumb little teenagers, um, going to, you know, beer parties and stuff. I hate to admit that, but those sort of things <laughs> did happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, playing rock power trio stuff. And, uh, you know, our guitar player was about 10 years older than, than me and my, my drummer buddy. And, and we got in a fair amount of trouble doing that when we were kids, but we also learned a whole lot. 
And, uh, you know, when we were in high school, we were playing gigs. We weren't working at McDonald's. Um, we, uh, were pretty blessed that way and, and really got to, got to learn a lot about life just playing in, in the bars back in the day. Um, before we were really old enough to do that, but the rules weren't the same back then. Uh, now, they were, they you... were, but they just weren't as followed uh, quite as tightly as they are now. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, one of the unique things I think, and I think you bring a lot of it, a lot of it to special consensus, is the fact that you actually studied jazz bat bass. And I mean, you kind of implement in your style of playing today too. And you know what, you know, that right there is, you know, something we need to discuss because that's unique for one musician. Well, as a bass player, I basically just kind of played whatever I had to play to make a living and what drew my interest. Um, and sometimes those two weren't always the same but I always got something out of each one of those. And I basically, I went to college on a music scholarship and I wasn't a classical player. So the only place I could end up was a jazz program. Back then um, there was no bluegrass programs around. Uh, back, we're talking about the mid eighties here that, I mean, that around where I was anyway in St. Louis area. So yeah, I, I ended up just kind of default going into a jazz program and just learning music um, in a deep way through studying jazz. And then I just went on ahead and went on through with a, a master's degree and uh, just started playing. And uh, that's brought me to the upright bass. I was just playing electric before that. Um, so I didn't really start playing upright bass till I was, you know, second year of college or so. I was a percussion major first. So I was playing drums. I still mm -hmm. do play drums, but that's what got me a scholarship originally. But mm -hmm. <laughs> there were no other bass players, so I ended up playing bass all the time and never hardly touched the drums. So I said, well, you know what? I'm just going to become a bass major and just do that. So <laughs> I did that and eventually kind of found my way back to bluegrass. I grew up on bluegrass and wanted to be a bluegrass musician until I got probably in the early high school and uh, everything just kind of changed. Uh, <laughs> started playing rock and roll and stuff. But, um, but eventually... I think it was around the time that Old oh Brother or Arthur came out. I, I that started leading me back to bluegrass, and eventually got me to Nashville, which uh, through all sorts of other little twists and turns got me an audition with Special Consensus. So that's the sort of the quick and dirty version of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and of course we're going to talk about the the length of time that you've had with uh, Special C and all the new adventures you guys are doing. Um, and, and that, but Dar uh, Darren, now uh, on to you. I mean, you know, you're a talented musician, um, in your own right as well from Western North Carolina. Um, you've been nominated for Grammys, you've nominated for IBMA awards, um, you've taken a few of those home. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, things that have brought you into the bluegrass world at, at the young age that you, um, were drawn to it. Yeah, basically, I've been playing this kind of music as long as I can remember. Uh, Western North Carolina has a rich heritage with bluegrass and old time music and um, and old time square dance and clogging. Uh, there were a lot of clogging teams from this area years ago. It was just a part of the culture that they used to teach old time music in the schools. And a lot of a lot of schools had clogging teams. And so like old time mountain dance, music, storytelling, uh, the oldest uh, folk festival in the nation happens in Asheville, North Carolina, which is about 20 minutes west of me um, and started by a guy named Basil Mamar Lunsford, who who's done a lot to, to promote traditional music uh, over the years. But my family played music. And so I grew up in a home where. Um, we listened to the Grand Ole Opry or WSM every single night. My dad played music. Everybody in my family played music. Friday and Saturday nights would would basically be we'd move all the furniture back in the house and there'd be 15, sometimes uh, five to 15 people in there playing music. And there'd be banjos and electric guitars and fiddles and and back then there wasn't this uh, segregation of like country music and bluegrass. It was just everybody getting together to pick. It was a social thing. But um, uh, in, in our house and, and a lot of people kind of 
like Conway Twitty and Merle Haggard and George Jones were kind of the same as Bill Monroe and Flat and Scruggs. Like they didn't, there wasn't let's play a bluegrass song or let's play a country song. It's just, that was, it was all kind of an amalgamation of things. But I started playing for tips when I was, I did, I've got pictures of my first show when I was 18 months old. I couldn't play, but I had a little plastic guitar and I was sitting on stage with my parents and they gave me the tip money. So <laughs> I, I, that's where I started making money. Um, <laughs> playing all around Western North Carolina at parties, events, uh, cakewalks, benefits, things like that. So it was just, I, I don't remember anything other than a musical life. Now, um, I got a question for you, Darren, about those tips when you were younger. Did you make more then than you do now? <laughs> uh, it's a lot of times. Hey, a kid, you know, you can't follow a kid or a dog act. You can put a kid on stage and if they're any good or not, people love it. So, you know, I probably did make more money than <laughs> do now i was gonna say uh i i guess uh dan and myself we got into jazz and bluegrass because we knew that's where all the money was <laughs> you know I, you know when you look about look back at your career uh darren um to this point um you've played with some top-notch artists um in the industry and then some of course you've recorded with vin skill zach brown band um earl scruggs um, just to name a few. I mean, you've really been playing with some stellar um, artists in the industry and in country and, you know, all across the board. Can you share with us um, one of your fondest memories with one of or several of those artists that you've played with uh, before joining up with Balsam Range? Yeah, um, my dad played honky tonk country music and and. In Western North Carolina, where I live, there's a, a a lot of these people in this mountain community. They went out west uh, to and actually very exclusively to Seattle, Washington, um, in the 50s and 60s, and they took mountain music with them. That's why there's a festival in Darrington, Washington. That's why there's all this bluegrass out there. Dan knows all about this. Um, and they used to have a thing called the Tar Hill Picnic because there were so many mountain people from Western North Carolina who went out there to log and, and work in the timber, but they took their instruments and they took the music with them. And that's why bluegrass in the Northwest um, kind of got going. But uh, in the sixties, when my dad was out there playing in honky tonks, Buck Owens and Merle Haggard were huge, you know, and my dad played old time fiddle, bluegrass fiddle, uh, but he also played electric guitar. And on a side note, that guitar right now, Chris Stapleton's got my dad's guitar and he plays it every night. And so that cool. guitar is still getting to play country music and honky tonk music, which is really cool. But um, in 2004, uh, I was playing with Alicia Nugent. We got an opportunity to do some shows with Merle Haggard and open. The first one we did was in Solomon's Island, Maryland. And John and TJ Osborne from the country band Brothers Osborne, uh, mm -hmm. they were in the band at that time. But we got to go backstage and meet Merle Haggard and I had this tiny little phone it was way before smartphones I, and I hadn't had a cell phone long but I actually got on the bus and and when everybody left I got to call I, I said would you care to talk to my dad on the phone he plays he you know he's put, made a living playing your music he loves you and so my dad got to talk to Merle Haggard on the phone for a few minutes and he died the following year he died on Valentine's Day of 2005 so that's a very special memory to me because you know we love Merle Haggard, we love his music. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, you know one of the the neatest things about um, being a performer and, and players as long as you have been, you guys have some amazing, great stories. And I know Special Consensus, Dan, you guys have some uh, really killer stories, um, and I hope you can share some because you know when you look at it. Um, it was, you know, what 1975 where Greg, you know, created and found it special C and, and it's still living on and going strong. Of course, members have come and gone, but you've been part of it for several years now in, in, in that, but you know, you guys have had so many talented musicians that you guys been playing with. Um, and that tell us a little bit about some of those one, wonderful stories of your guys's and who you um, played with and, and, you know, remember those days. Well, I've, I've been in the band uh, eight. I'm going on eight years now in, in April, which is hard to believe. Um, four records. Um, so, starting off with the uh, um, the lineup that was on my first one was was me, 
uh, on bass, uh, Greg obviously on banjo, Rick Ferris was on mandolin, and uh, we had Dustin Benson on guitar, <laughs> and so that was the lineup that uh, recorded the John Denver uh, tribute record, where we, we played all John Denver tunes, um, arrangements of them, and just brought basically everybody that's ever been in bluegrass was on that record so <laughs> just about uh True. yeah it was a cavalcade of, of bluegrass stars and that was <laughs> kind of my there's the record and that's that was kind of a baptism by fire for me because that was <laughs> my first like real bluegrass recording um and i hadn't been in the band very long at all when that started um so getting thrown in to uh Compass Studio, the old uh, Hillbilly Central, where so much of the music that we all love was recorded by Waylon and and uh, and you know the Hartford uh, Aeroplane record was done there. Uh, it's just it, I could go on and on about that studio. Every time I'm in there, I I just can't believe that I'm in that room. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we grew up with those records, and you know my my grandmother wore out that Outlaws record. Um, the Waylon and Willie Outlaws record. Um, and, you know, anyway, so it meant a lot to me to be in that room. And then the people that, that came in to record with us, I mean, you know, Rhonda Vincent was probably one of the first bluegrass acts with Sally Mountain when she was about 12 years old, first bands I probably ever saw um, growing up in Missouri. So, you know, for her to come in and, and sing was a big deal for me because, you know, I've been listening to her and her family for a long, long time. And uh, that was pretty amazing. And, you know, Jim Lauderdale and uh, Cowan came in and sang on it. It was, it was just crazy, um, <laughs> which is kind of cool because later I got Cowan to come and sing on my record. So that's, that's <laughs> kind of neat the way those connections kind of happen. And, and then just the first, uh, you know, I can't really say enough about working with Allison Brown. Um, and, you know, that just started a relationship that's been so much fun and grown so much from just being around her. Um, she's just brilliant and she's, she's a great producer and a great musician and mm -hmm. she just makes you better. She, she stretches you outside of your comfort zone and uh, gets things out of you that you probably didn't know you had. Um, has, so, has, have you two, um, I mean, I know, you know, the fact folks probably know a little bit about what Allison does. Of course, she's a producer. She's a record uh, label owner with her husband with Compass Records. But, you know, she's a stellar banjo player, of course. But uh, she's kind of got a nice jazz feel to some of her albums mm -hmm. that are out there. Ha have you ever, like, you know, approached her, hey, let's get, let's do a little jazz album together, you know, together? I mean, well, I, think I, I would love to do something like that with Allison, but she's got this husband that's a bass player. So it's, it's kind of ruins hard. everything. That's a tough nut to crack, you know? So I would love to, I would love to, and she knows I would, I've made it very yeah. plain. So, so someday that might happen. <laughs> <laughs> now, is there, um, for the two of you, is there other, um, of course, you both have um, amazing, great solo albums out. Dan, of course, yours is um, Look What the City's Done um, that you've put out uh, just recently. Uh, phenomenal project um, produced by uh, yourself and Chas Williams. Um, and then, of course, Daring, you have a collection of solo projects. Um, I'm going to try to hold up as many as I can. <laughs> 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 I mean, here's one. Look, and, and you're right. You kind of had some hair then, man. <laughs> I know. I, I know what you're thinking. Have you ever thought about playing bad music without recording it? I know. That's what you're thinking. Oh, no. But no, I haven't. I've recorded everything. <laughs> you know, front as well. And okay, you guys. Oh, well, there's obviously my store. Yeah. Hey, tell us about that um, wonderful stickers and t shirts that you recently had made up for your store to sell. Um, well, so Sex sales, let's just be honest. And uh, there's me in my underwear on a couch. And uh, I just thought, you know, something that the girls and some of the guys would really like. So. <laughs> and what was that what number was that again? <laughs> <laughs> I do have some stickers. I actually sell more of that than I do my music. I've got hats and, and uh, just the mercantile. I've got masks. That's my silhouette right there. 
I haven't sold any mud flaps yet, but that's me in all my glory. But I love the, I, I did, uh, we came up with this. We were ta- we were saying one night on the way to the gig, say no to drugs and say yes to Scruggs. And so I think that's a shirt that everybody needs in bluegrass right there. Definitely. Yeah. We love Earl Scruggs. I'm from North Carolina. I've played at the Earl Scruggs Center down there and uh, uh, just love his music. All right. So, uh, uh, D- Darren, uh, tell us a little bit about your newest project, because I know a radio has a couple singles of yours that you just recently yep. released. Um, so you're getting back in there doing some more solo projects uh, during this pandemic. Is that what's been kind of keeping you busy? What or what is keeping you busy during this uh, well, last well, year? <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, it's about all we can do right now is record or teach. You know, there's a lot of virtual teaching going on. But, you know, we're in a situation where we're powerless. You know, this is out of our hands. And so um, the only, you know, we just got to change our attitude and kind of change gears. And, and I can't go out and play live shows. I can't be out with people. So what can I do? Let's make the best of my time. So I've done a lot of songwriting and I do a, uh, just finished writing a couple tunes with Eric Gibson, my buddy Mark Bumgarner, Brink Brinkman, and I've written a couple tunes. But about 95% of the songs I've written have been with Charles Humphrey the Third. He's a founding member of Steep Canyon Rangers, but uh, Charles uh, has a band called Songs from the Road Band now, and he lives in West Asheville. He's about 20 minutes from me, and um, I, I absolutely love writing songs with him, and I've really gotten into that. It's been a positive way to um, like it's ignited a different part of my, I've always considered myself a singer first, you know, and, and kind of a musician second, but the songwriting is just a, it's a, it's been amazing for me. It's been, it's just been a, a, almost a spiritual experience this year is something new to do with music, something to keep me excited. So, um, one of those songs is about to be released. There's a session called bluegrass at the crossroads. And we did like an all-star compilation and it's, Kevin Kerberg, uh, Jeremy Garrett from the String Dusters, um, Skip Cherry Holmes, Kristen Benson, myself, and Travis Book. And we did, uh, we recorded five or six tunes. And one of the songs that Charles and I wrote called Lonesome is the Price I Pay is going to be dropping on February 16th. And so that's going out, that's one of the new songs. And I'm currently working on uh, a, a solo electric record of a bunch of these original tunes it's almost kind of rock rockabilly rock and some of it's rock and roll some of it's country but uh and then of course balsam range went in and we cut like we've got like uh 15 or 16 songs cut and we just released another thing we've released three singles so far during uh quarantine and the last one is called rivers and rains and runaway trains Mm -hmm. Uh, it just came out a couple weeks ago so you know, we can't play live, but we're, you know, trying to be, con, you know, constructive and oh yeah, you know, it's our time. Well, and, and that's the key thing. And I know this, uh, this had to put a halt to a uh, special consensus, Dan, because you guys just released, you know, the Chicago Barn Dance, the uh, 45th anniversary, um, anniversary album for the band and, you know, paying tribute to Chicago. How did, how did that kind of like, you Worst know, obviously- timing ever. I know, right? <laughs> so it's like, all right, where do you go from there where you have this album celebrating 45 years of the band and you can't go out and perform? What are you guys, what have you guys been up to with that? Well, in in the uh, in the early part of the, the shutdown, we uh, we did do some some video uh, record recording. Uh, guys came down to Nashville. You know, Nate Burry, who's our, our mandolin player now, lives mm-hmm. here. Um, so Greg and Rick came into town and we, we did a little, uh, quick hit for, uh, for the CBA over the father's day bluegrass festival time, which we would have been playing. Um, obviously that didn't happen. Um, so we are part of their, their video, uh, broadcast. That was really cool. Uh, And then we, we just kind of did a little bit extra just to throw up on Facebook. And eventually we, uh, we did get around to the IBMA virtual award show, um, which was, a, it was strange. It was a thrill because that, that was the first time I'd gotten into the, on the Ryman stage. I've been on the wings before um, and I've been to shows, but I hadn't been on the actual stage, but I had to put my back to the, to the seats. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, but you know what? That's all right. It's to be on that, 
on that stage. Um, That's right. That was one of the uh, unlooked for benefits of this was was that at least personally for me um so that's basically what we did we just had a had some a couple of video projects and then the ibma award show was sort of the crowning jewel of the of the whole thing for us um this year but it's just too bad uh i i love the record it's you know we really stretched on it um we we got interesting songs from a lot of different places and did some really cool arrangements uh, that, you know, just never got to see the light of day. So, um, but, you know, we've got some things coming up in April, um, keeping the fingers crossed. Um, if specialc.com that you're showing there has got our, our tour uh, schedule and we're just hoping that, you know, that all pans out. Um, last year we were, you know, looking at dates um, two months out, three months out and, and they'd cancel and sometimes they wouldn't. And uh, we just never knew what, what we we're looking at. So we're just hoping that, that we're going to be able to put it out there a little bit. So we're, uh, we're going to be touring that material when we get back out. Um, so we're, we're working hard at, at getting it together and getting it out there. Yep. There we are. So we're doing a little run in, in Florida in April, um, which should be fun. And then we're going to play the ISIS over there in your backyard, Darren. So Yeah, I love uh, the ISIS Music Hall. And yeah, uh, man. you guys, will, you'll love that venue. It's a great venue. Well, we're looking real forward to it. We, we've been hoping to get in that room for a long time. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's going to be fun. I, I, I love playing North Carolina. So I'm going to come see you if I can. Room. Well, I hope so, man. It's like. April 24th or something like that. Um, but yeah, check it out. So there's Michelle. <laughs> I, I, I would just like to say that a uh, special consensus. I first met Greg Cahill back in the early two thousands. I was introduced to him by Steve Sutton, great banjo player from North Carolina. Oh, and oh, um, Greg has always had an awesome band. You know, he's always had a great band. He's such a great guy. He's done so much. Uh, between teaching and doing the work in the schools to to help promote the kind of music that we love. And he's got a killer band now. I love Dan's playing. Uh, Dustin Benson told me about him. I knew Dustin very well years ago, but I've been a fan of Dan's playing and that, that whole band for a long time. They're a great bunch of guys. And if you get a chance to go see them on the road, you won't be disappointed. They make great records. They have a great live show. They're just a class act. I, We're big fans of y'all too, man. So it goes both ways, son. Believe me. <laughs> Well, I know there's, um, I, Rick had a question, Sammy, if you don't mind popping that back up for us, um, I'd greatly appreciate it. He had a question, uh, Rick from California, of course, loyal fan of Bluegrass Specialties yes, and Boston Range. So um, uh, he wants to know, Dan, being a longtime member of Special Consensus and of course, Darren of Boston Range, uh, both of these bands haven't been around for quite a long time. What would you attribute the longevity of the band's? and your own longevity as a member. We'll go with Dan first. Well, I would attribute uh, Special C's longevity to tenacity of Greg Cahill uh, and the hard work of Greg Cahill. Um, that man goes down in his basement and puts a coffee on and starts answering emails and working the phone, and he doesn't come up again until his wife gets back from work at eight in the evening. Uh, well, of course, it's different now since she's working out of the house. But anyway, you get what I'm saying. Um, he works and works. That's how. Um, and always having his ear to the ground for the best players um, and singers. You got to remember, everybody in Special C has got to sing. Uh, so he's got a he's got a real good ear for who's going to blend um, both groove wise and and vocally. So he's just got that sense. Um, he's one of those people. And he's always just been able to put it together. As, as far as, as myself, um, I, I'm, I'm real close with Greg. Uh, he's one of my best friends. And it's really hard to imagine not being in a band with Greg Cahill for me at this point. Um, and, and everybody that's come through the band is also, we're all brothers, you know. Um, mm -hmm. We 
one of the saddest things about this past year is that we missed having the 45th anniversary show. Um, every five years, we do a giant anniversary show. Um, and we couldn't do it this year. So it's, it's getting, it got punted into next year. So it'll be a 45 plus one anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, that's always a big deal to, uh, to, to have that thing and see all of the, the players that are out there everybody comes through that played on the records and, and plays a tune or two. So and it ends up being a, a massive event because there's been something like 46 or eight players in the band over mm -hmm. the years. Not all of them were on records, but um, a pretty vast majority were. So, so yeah, that, that's how I would answer that. It's just, just a tenacity from Greg Cahill, um, a nose for talent um, and the willingness to just he loves the music first i mean I, that's i mean i can't really say enough about that how much you have to love the music to do all the stuff you have to do to put it out there i mean it's it's not easy you know it's no picnic running a band and uh doing all the things you have to do um and the payoff is the music so and that's what uh that's what all of us do it for is is that and i guess that's a short answer a long answer that should have been shorter so anyway yeah <laughs> all right darren how about you and uh balsam rains <laughs> don't quit that's it that's all i got no yeah <laughs> uh you know honestly there's something to be said for just perseverance just not quitting you know uh in bluegrass especially you know there's a lot of times you'll see bands that make a lot of money and they hate each other and, but they stay together because of the money. So in bluegrass where there's, you know, there's not this big economic payoff. A lot of times you'll see people, they just up and quit because, you know, they're not making a lot of money. It's hard travel and one little thing goes wrong and they quit. And so uh, you see so much personnel change in bluegrass. And I think that's, that's part of it. But um you, Balsam Range got together. We all live in the same county. We all live about five, ten minutes from each other, which is extremely rare in, in bluegrass. Uh, most people are usually spread out. I think that's a big part of it. Um, Tim and I came off the road about the same time. Um, Buddy had left a band. Caleb had left a band. And Mark uh, was playing locally. He wasn't playing with Ricky Skaggs anymore. He's playing with a local group. And we just all found ourselves at home at the same time. Buddy and I did a couple of solo records, and that's kind of how the band started. But, you know, just the convenience of it is a big thing. But when we sat down, we had all played music professionally at some level. And we all knew what we didn't like about the music business. We all knew what we liked about it, what we didn't want to do. I mean, there's a lot of shows every year that we don't do just because – we, we said early on, we're going to do this and it's going to be fun. We're not going to play everything that comes along and burn ourselves out and get sick of each other. And so we, we had like a seldom seen type approach because, you know, our goal was just to play local shows. I didn't want to go back out on the road. I wanted to play local gigs at home and come home. I had a young son at the time. Now he's graduated high school. And um, so uh, you know, that's kind of how we we set down as businessmen first. And we said, here's our business plan. Here, Here's the things we want to do. Here's the, here's our goals. You know, when you approach it, a lot of bands form out of a jam session or the fun of the music, and they don't think ahead to all the, the business part of it, the logistics. And so Balsam Range has never been the best players or singers, but I got in a group with four really savvy businessmen and that has been the key to it for me you know we knew you know we weren't planning on setting the world on fire we just had we were like-minded and ideas and goals what we wanted to do and i think that's kind of been how we've held it together you know well you know well, you know, um, um amazing um, great um and, and i got to touch on this on both of you guys because uh, special consensus on rivers and you guys have a 10 string symphony join in on, on a tune um, on this album. And then of course, Balsam range plays with the Atlanta pops orchestra. You know, 
I, how was that bringing that in uh, into the music that you guys perform? Um, we'll go with Darian first, because, you know, when you get a whole or orchestra going and create a whole album out of it, you know, how was that working with uh, the Atlanta Pops Orchestra? I love it, but I love music. I'm like Dan, you know, I, I like jazz. I love blues music. I love nothing's really off limits. Mm -hmm. And okay. I don't think it all fits together if it's done the right way. I, now, I, I've heard a lot of bluegrass with orchestras where it was like a square peg in a round hole and it didn't fit. But the guy that we had score our songs had a bluegrass background. So he kind of knew. And so it, 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 uh, orchestra with a bluegrass band should be like a texture. It should really come together like a, like country music, like where it's everything's got a very specific place you know and the orchestra's not overpowering the bluegrass band this and that and 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 it should be very tasteful the way it complements each other and so that was our our first goal but i mean i i played in i played violin i was in strings all through middle school into high school i loved classical music um but that was just i, I just there's so many songs um that balsam range has done not all of them some of them are three chords in a cloud of dust you know like barn burning bluegrass you and that you know that probably ain't going to fit with the orchestra but there's a lot of songs that we have there's like man i could hear an orchestra with this and and picking the right material is is kind of key to pulling that off too but mm -hmm. we all just love that kind of music we love on ensembles we love working with other musicians it makes you a better musician and Anything that gets you out of your comfort zone and, and out of the box. I've always heard if you're always comfortable, it means you're not growing. And so, you know, I, I love things that, that push me and, and the orchestra is just is so much fun. It is so much fun. <laughs> well, and, and, and this album, um, Rivers and Roads, of course, you guys took home an IBMA award for, uh, for album of the year as well as uh, the instrumental uh, record of the year for squirrel hunters on this, but again, working with the 10 string symphony, how was that for you guys? And how did that kind of come together? Well, uh, 10 string, despite the name, it's actually two people. They're playing five string fiddle. Um, it's a uh, Rachel Bayman and Christian Settlemeyer. So it's, that's how it goes, but they sound like there are a whole bunch more of them. So. <laughs> the truth comes out. <laughs> yeah, that's Ten String Symphony. They're 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 an act that they're they're great. Allison had been working with them uh, on their project on their record, which was on Compass, I believe. Um, and she has, uh, you know, she's always thinking ahead on our records of, of who she might get involved when the, when the time comes and, mm -hmm. uh, we've recorded, uh, uh, squirrel hunters, the, the old, old time tune that, um, John Hartford was well known for playing. And we were kind of doing a Hartford, uh, like a hidden Hartford theme on that record. Um, not so hidden maybe, but, um, but we used his, his version. Of, he had a YouTube teaching video of that tune and it's kind of iconic for just, you know, watching Hartford teach a tune. Mm -hmm. um, and we use that as sort of a template for the recording. And so they sort of laid their parts over Hartford's parts. Uh, we, it was the magic of the studio. We snuck that in there off the YouTube video um, and used it as an intro piece. And then we arranged the rest of the song out from there. So, so that was it, but we've used every record. We will we'll have, I mean, we will have fiddlers, at least two on each record, and there it gets the text. The textures get pretty thick um, when you get you know really fine fiddle players on those records, and and we have them on every one mm -hmm. at some point. So um, yeah, it's just adding, even if it's not a complete symphony, uh, just that extra layer or two extra layers of, of stringed instruments that have a sustaining quality to them, which you know bluegrass instruments don't do um the fiddle's the only one that can do that the dobro can to an extent but you know the rest of them unless you're playing tremolo uh you don't have a sustaining instrument and and to have that quality um that layer of timbre let's say um on a record it really really helps everything out because everything else is kind of hitting and punchy and uh the strings sort of smooth all that out 
Um, and that really helps a lot on a bluegrass record. Special C, before, long before I was around, did do some symphony orchestra uh, stuff in Chicago. And uh, um, we did do a guest uh, performance uh, with, uh, on an Irish uh, feature, like a Celtic uh, feature with a Chicago, not the symphony orchestra, but I can't remember which, which ensemble it was. But anyway, we did get to, to perform with an orchestra, but that didn't get recorded. But it was a live performance. It was really, really crazy to sit in a string section you know, in a the band's right here, and then there's a string section around you, and it's like, <laughs> wow. It <was> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was strange because I've I've never played in an orchestra. Um, I I like I played jazz. I never played classical music. Um, I studied classical music, but I never really played it. Um, um, played in concert band, but I was playing percussion back behind everybody. Um, but to actually sit in a section like that was really. Uh, quite an interesting uh, perspective to have it's so, hard <laughs> <laughs> so dan um and and darren but dan first um you know when you were looking at you know compiling your songs for your solo album look what the city's done um how is that differ from when you guys as special c is trying to compile the songs that you'd like to put on your next album well um <clears throat> with with my record, it was just me deciding to do the songs I wanted to do, um, and they were mostly uh, I wrote most of them, and uh, then there was a couple of key key arrangements of uh, of of cover songs that I one that we'd been doing in Special C, um, and then the rest of them were just songs that I just felt like I wanted to get on a record of my own, and uh, I wrote. I co-wrote Rome with John Weisberg and I co-wrote Rome with Tony Ra Tony Rackley and the rest of them uh, with three or four more that I wrote. And uh, then I, I also did kind of a strange version of uh, Cattle in the Cane. Um, and uh, you'll have to hear it to really understand it, but it's, it's, it's salsa fied bluegrass. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's bass, mandolin and congas. Uh, so it's, it's very strange, but cool as it can be. I really enjoyed doing that. So the, the difference is, is that when Special C does a record, we're bringing in material from all sorts of directions from, you know, we start getting uh, solicited for, for getting a song on the record, you know, about a year out from when we start actually making it. Mm -hmm. And so Allison gets stuff, we get stuff. We write stuff because we end up with a theme. Usually we work off of a theme um, in special C. Every record has some sort of a unifying uh, theme in it. And this last one was Chicago. So uh, that was easy enough. We had to find some bluegrass songs about Chicago. Well, that should be no problem, right? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> that was a challenge. Let me tell you, uh, the writers probably all hate us now, but um, cause it was really tough to, to get that figured out, but we, we eventually did. Um, and we just had to take some songs that were not really of the bluegrass idiom and bend it into that idiom to mm -hmm. make it work. Um, and, and it was fun doing it. And, uh, I got to, to put one on there. I wrote one that, uh, went through a lot of edits, uh, to get it, uh, you know, ready for the record because, other songs would come in that had some of the same reference points. And I'm like, no, oh, I got to get that out of there. <laughs> and, you know, I ended up, I, I had a chorus that was working. The verses had to get trashed um, and be rebuilt again. So, um, but yeah, that, that's sort of how it goes. It was a special C record. We were gathering in from all sorts of directions on, on a solo record and not, at least for me, not quite so much. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I really wanted to be more of a writer when I, when I first moved to Nashville, I've sort of grown out of that, but uh, <laughs> not that I will never write again, but I don't write as much as I, as I once did. I, I really was going after it there for a little bit. Right. And then uh, it just, I don't know what I wrote really was just for me. And <laughs> I, I just kind of kept it that way, I guess. Right. Um, so, yeah. 
And how about you, Darren? I mean, of course, you've had several uh, solo projects out and, of course, uh, just a few with uh, Balsam Range. How does that differ for you and to work with the band and yourselves kind of like figuring out which ones you want to keep to yourself and, you know, pitch to the band? Uh, for me, it comes down to like what fits, you know, there are certain things that fit some solo stuff that probably maybe wouldn't fit a Balsam Range record. Uh, the same thing as Dan, like Balsam Range is a collective effort. We're getting uh, material from all these different places and we decide, you know, what's, what is the Balsam Range sound? What, what is, what's a song? We, we, we're really big on lyrics. Um, that's kind of been the, the uh, I, I would say that's what Balsam Range is known for is like material, you know, mm-hmm. trying to find good songs, you know, that are, um, that appeal to the masses. And, uh, you know, like I think of bands like the Eagles, you know, and all their their material, they were a great band, obviously, but their material was so strong that it kind of stands on its own. And and bands like that are timeless, you know, and that's, you know, we're not the Eagles, but we're always going for trying to find the best material. Same way uh, with the solo project, but if you want to see my personality, uh, you know, you'll get a solo project or you'll come see me at a solo show uh, without Balsam Range, but you know, Balsam Range, the ensemble, you know, that we, we kind of do that collectively. And there's songs that I do on the solo thing, you know, that wouldn't fit Balsam Range, that wouldn't that wouldn't be our style or whatever. But that's why you do solo projects, because you have creative parts of you that you want to get out uh, somewhere else. And some of my favorite artists, two, two of the people at the top of my list that, I, well, three, one is Tim O'Brien, uh, one is Daryl Scott and the other is Marty Stewart. And what I love about their music uh, is every record is different. You know what I mean? There's like there might be a Celtic record. Then there's a Mississippi blues record. Then there's a country record. Then there's a you know, they're always trying for something different. It's not the same thing every time because I think they get bored musically. And I find myself doing the same thing. You know, I want to keep kind of pushing the, the, the boundaries and and really good material is just the that's and and the older i get the more and more i'm i get into original material i think young players kind of like to do covers and and play the songs from their favorite players but as you get older you kind of grow out of that and you start coming into your own a little bit and realizing how important being original having your own sound having your own style having your own tunes how important that is and how, how do you and, you know, when, you know, folks are not comparing, you know, sort of hard bluegrass, and, you know, I think, thing, and I, I want to thank you guys both agree, is you got to be your, yourself and, you need, and bring the same to the table um, for, you know, all fans to enjoy. Um, because, you know, the, the music, the bluegrass community is so huge in different styles of bluegrass. And, 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 Special C as well as Boston Range are definitely bring their own, and you know exactly who you're listening to when you tune in. It. You're on listening to the radio, or you happen on, you know to Bluegrass Music TV and watch some videos before you even see who it is. You can tell by by your guys' instrumental playing um, from band to band and who who it might be. Uh, do you think um, as as younger generations uh, in bluegrass, you know, are are coming out and especially now during this pandemic, a lot of them have been going to social media um, and, and kind of, you know, doing a little mini shows and little um, putting some songs out there. What, what kind of advice can you give them, um, you know, as they're developing their foundation and and being true to themselves? Um, Dan, we'll go with you first. Well, actually I, I need to pay more attention to what they're doing and they need to give me the advice to be honest, because we're in a different world now and uh, they're more equipped for it than I am um, for sure. I mean, I'm, you know, the, the advice that I might've given them a year ago might've been valid, but I, I really don't know what I would tell them now. Mm-hmm. All I could, one thing that I think is, is absolutely universal and, that's just practice your instrument and practice singing and practice and write and just keep doing stuff. Um, and don't, 
get so caught up in all of the, uh, you know, I know social media is important and I know all of that stuff, but if, if you don't have all of the actual abilities covered that you need to put something out there that really sounds good, I mean, you could be an expert at video production or whatever, but if, if you don't have the musical aspect covered, you're going to short yourself. Mm. Um, so I, I would like to see just more attention paid to just personal growth on your instrument, singing, writing, um, before the rest of what it takes to put a, a product out there online. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I don't know what to think about all that. It's, it's a tough thing because getting out there and playing live, you know, pretty quick if you're getting it done or not. Um, I, I think it's a little less of a, of a, an obvious thing uh, with the online world. Um, you know, if people start snapping their lawn chairs and walking out, you know, <laughs> you know that it's not <laughs> happening. Uh, you don't, you don't have that same experience um, when you're, when you're doing an online show. Right. So, you know, I, I, just the things that always were there are still going to be there, but I, I really think that we all need to learn from the young ones that are really doing it right and, uh, and doing it well. So, yeah, I'm looking at them for, for advice, to be honest. <laughs> How about you, Darren? <laughs> I, I think this is a great opportunity for, for people to kind of cultivate their own thing because they're not in, uh, we're not around other musicians. We're not being influenced. You're going to see some people have like breakout careers out of this pandemic just because they're just doing their thing. And, and one of, we always tip our hat back to tradition in bluegrass but the reality is if you the most traditional thing you can do in bluegrass is not sound like anybody else. Bill Monroe, Flat and Scruggs, Jim and Jesse, the Osbournes, Stanley Brothers, they all tried to sound different. And now there's a generation of people who are just trying to sound like Bill Monroe or trying to sound like Flat and Scruggs. And the re even if you play it better than them, they did it first. And so you have to do your own thing like like that's that is just so important. That's what I would tell a young musician is, um, you know, having your own identity. Like Bill Monroe, he was doing his own thing, you know, and, and if that that's um, that's that's kind of that's what keeps bluegrass music alive and fresh and keeps it new. And, you know, when you sound when you have your own thing, the only person you're ever in competition with is yourself. So many people, especially in bluegrass or some of these sub genres or underground genres, there's such a hard competition for shows and gigs and notoriety and this and that. It, they, they make it a competition and it doesn't have to be. As long as you're doing your own thing, you're never in competition with anybody. Right, you know, right. you can go on behind anybody. You can play in front of anybody just because the only person you're in competition with is yourself to do your best. That is the thing I would. I would tell young musicians and, you know, just trying to, and I, you know, I'm 37 years old and honestly, I just feel like in the last couple of years, I'm really finding my own voice and my own place in the music, like where, I, where I am comfortable with what I'm doing and, you know, the direction that I'm in, but Dan hit on something, especially in the world of social media. Now, like when the pandemic first came out, everybody was saying, you got to have great video production and audio. That's the only way people will listen to you. Well, then a lot of times people would have great video and audio, but they weren't that good. The music wasn't that good. And I would pass on really nice, high quality videos. And I would rather watch Daryl Scott or Dennis Parker just sit on the couch and play mm -hmm. because they're so, you know, it's like, the music has to be there first, the talent, the music, the individuality that has to be there first. I, I think people are smart enough to recognize nothing sells better than the real thing. And even though you dress it up, you know, you can only polish a turd so much. It's only, you know, it's still a turd, you know, so you, gotta, you know, people seek out the real music. They're going to find the people who are doing the real things, the original music that are, you know, doing their own thing that are the real deal. You know, people, the cream rises to the top and you're going to see a lot of that come out of this pandemic. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of that pandemic, of course, um, we're approaching 
Expo. We're at a year, um, and, but pretty much our lockdown back in March of 2020. And so you guys have definitely ventured into some unique things and got yourself some great uh, opportunities. Like uh, Darren, you had mentioned earlier about, you know, doing Zoom lessons and Skype lessons and things like that to kind of you know, help with um, the fact that down the road. But Dan, do, do, now do we call you Professor Dan? There's only one of those. There's only one of those. I know. I, because, I mean, we got Professor Dan Boner, and now we have yeah. Professor Dan Eubanks. <laughs> oh no, he's he's the real professor. I'm I'm just a guy helping out with his bass lessons. That's all. But, uh, <laughs> no, um, no, I'm I'm extremely uh, happy that I'm I'm part of the ETSU faculty now. Um, just started that this semester. Mm -hmm. um, which is which is a thrill for me because I'm I'm a big fan of their program and and the folks that have come through it have become some of my really good friends and jam buddies and stuff like that. Um, everybody that's come through there has just been, you know, they can get it done. Uh, so they they definitely are doing it right uh, in that program. And uh, you know, I, I used to before I moved to Nashville, I was I was adjunct teaching, which is what they call the not full timers in college world. If you, if you don't know that term and that's uh, that's what I am now uh, for ETSU, but I did that in the St. Louis area for like six different schools for wow. years. Um, I'd be running all over the place. You know, I'd have a night's class here and teach a lesson here and direct a combo here. And, you know, I was running like that and playing gigs for, you know, most of my adult life before I, came to Nashville. Um, and then I, you know, my teaching has all been private and at camps and stuff like that since then. So it's, it's nice to be associated with the, with the university again. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm really excited about it. And especially one like ETSU, it's, it's just been great. And um, I'm a big fan of that program and everybody over there. And, you know, and also just really heartbroken for them all right now, as we saw at the top of the show. So I don't want to go too far down that again, but I can't talk about ETSU without talking about Frosty. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's what amazing. What a way to start the semester. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, as you're looking at the next stuff, uh, hopefully near future of getting back on the road and touring, I know some sh some shows are, are on – the books, but uh, how are you guys? Uh, are you guys ready for this? Are you ready to get back on the road and uh, be playing for a live audience, even if it is at a, a limited capacity? Um, Darren, I think you guys have something lined up to, towards the end of the month. Yeah, I've pretty much given up on playing live shows. I'm just going to sell my blood and be a possum farmer. I think that's pretty much what I'm going to do. <laughs> to hell with trying to book another show. I found myself last year, things would reschedule, and then they would they would cancel again. Mm -hmm. And so I found, I got to a point where I'm like, I'm not rescheduling anything till this is over. Cause it's just so heartbreaking to reschedule and then wait on it. And then it, we, we do have a couple of things on the books, but I mean, I honestly, I don't know if they're going to, they're going to happen. Right. And so, right. um, I mean, uh, you know, I would have never taken a year off myself uh, just because I love to work. I love being out with people, love doing shows. But I honestly, I've had a lot of good things come out of this pandemic. And, I, I you know, I, I'm probably going to make some people angry because, you know, um, because they've had such a hard time in the pandemic. And, I, and I've had a hard time, too. Um, but, you know, I've been traveling since I was 18 years old. Well, I've been playing music my whole life. I've never had a Friday or Saturday night off as long as I can remember. Well, you're so, getting hyper, hyper. Do what? You're getting tipped. <laughs> Uh, that's right. Yeah, getting tip money. So I've actually got to spend some time with my family this year and get into the songwriting thing. And I'm just trying to look at the the positives of it. A friend of mine said to me the other day, he said, uh, well, how are you handling this? Because I was really struggling with it. I'm like, man, I miss doing shows. I miss getting out there. And I was, you know, it's easy to get depressed. It's easy to get down and start looking at all the negative things, you know. And so having positive people around you and trying to trying to keep a good attitude has kind of been crucial for me. But my friend said, how are you handling this pandemic as opposed to the other pandemics you've been through? And it just makes you realize, oh, 
yeah, this is new for all of us. We're all struggling. We're all having a hard time. We None of us have the answers. None of us know what to do. Uh, so we're just kind of doing the best we can. If a show happens, awesome. If it don't happen, that's okay too. You know, I've just got to accept that. You know, I'm not in control of these things. And just kind of, I'm just kind of living a day at a time and just, you know, trying to make, trying to have good attitude about it. But I, I don't know when live shows are going to come back. I, I know I miss human beings. I even miss the aggravating festival people, the ones who come to me. I, I'm like a magnet for any any kind of crazy person they come to me and i get i don't know why but the uh i even miss those people you the the ones who ask me why does the biggest guy play the smallest instrument 15 <laughs> times you know the ones who get in the face with awful breath and face talk to you about mac what mac wiseman did in 1946 i even miss those people you know? I, i'm sure I, I am it's been uh it's a lot of good things about being off, but I'm ready to get back out there. But yeah, yeah. you know, I'm just kind of having to roll with the flow like everybody else right now. Dan, Dan I know I got the getting uh, uh, with e ESTU, and uh, but uh, you also, you guys, uh, you and your wife just took in a, a dog, right? <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> um, she was she was in here a little while ago. Um, yeah, she's she's a a rescue dog that. Um, I, I get, I've always kind of gotten involved with, with animals. Um, they, uh, animals, uh, come to me like those people at the festival come to Darren. So I, <laughs> I, that's, that's, that's been my cross to bear, but, um, uh, I always end up with strays, um, wherever I go. Um, so this little pup, uh, came to us from a, from a rescue organization here in, in, in our neighborhood. Um, and we got hip to him originally because a friend of ours lost her dog. She got out on her mom and dad one day and was gone for like a month. And these folks got her. They're like, they're professionals who don't get paid at getting dogs back to their homes. Mm -hmm. um, so as a result, they often, have uh, some fosters around and when our old dog passed away last summer um we were really depressed and everything and uh, this this uh, organization uh, that we work with before uh, i knew had some dogs and we were like well maybe we should see if they have any you know and we ended up with a, a three-year-old um pity coon dog uh mix named Chloe and she's, she's pretty crazy. That's uh, awesome. Love yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. So the, the thing is, is the, the pandemic is I'm around the house a lot and that dog is like Velcro to me and I don't know what's going to happen <laughs> when I go back out on the road. So it's going to be some serious. Just take it with anxiety. you. I want to, if I could get Greg to <laughs> let her in the room at night, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, but what Darren was saying is so true. It's like you, you really don't know what what to make of of a schedule these days. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if the stuff happens, you go do it. Um, be as safe as you can. Um, and, you know, just just do your best. Um, we're not in control. It's just we're just not. And right. uh, and, and I'm a bit of a control freak. So that that's not good for me. Um, so I have to like learn some coping strategies, which has been good for me. So, um, so, you know, it's all, there's a silver lining to all of it basically. And uh, if you choose to see it and I'm not the best at seeing it all the time and I'm trying to get better. So. Well, I wish uh, you guys uh, the best of luck getting back on the road, being safe, like you said, as uh, we encourage everybody to do. Um, I want to remind folks again, you know, um, to check out bossrange.com, uh, Darren Nicholson.net, um, as well as specialc.com uh, for the latest and the greatest music that has been created by two amazing award winning bands, Bossom Range, as well as uh, Special Consensus. And again, can't wait to see you guys back on the road. Hopefully it won't be too far, uh, too far for long. Um, but I, I can't wait to hear more great music. Can't wait for that brand new album from Boston Range. Of course, been enjoying uh, the Chicago Barn Dance. 
um, yeah. as a uh, you know special seats celebrated 45 years of amazing great music. Right. And um, yeah. thank you so much, both of you, for uh, being part of the show today and giving me the time and getting a little real with us um, because I think it's important when you, we get together in, in different aspects and hearing from different folks from different bands and getting a chance to hear from our, our fellow listeners who join us at festivals and buy our merchandise and and then I think that's a, a, a nice way for them to also be able to uh, talk with you guys as well especially during this pandemic and um, so you know thank you again for your time and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys soon and also to Sammy Passamano who's behind the scenes taking care of all the reels and deals uh, that happens to make this thing uh, work with Bluegrass Music TV and I want to make sure you all head over to uh, bluegrassmusictv.com and subscribe to Bluegrass Music TV Prime um, for all things Bluegrass with Ronnie Reno's old time um, show the 615 Hideaway uh, shows as well as Woodsong's classics, Real Talk with yours truly, me, Michelle Lee, and so much more. Four ninety five a month, Bluegrass Music, right there for Bluegrass Music TV Prime. Just go to bluegrassmusictv.com. And again, if you'd like to um, see the wonderful video put together um, in uh, memory of Frosty, uh, it is on Bluegrass Music Television, uh, YouTube, and Facebook as well. Again, I invite you to uh, join us for Real Talk Bluegrass. Uh, we'll keep you up to date when the next one will be and who our next uh, guest will be as we get real here on Real Talk. And again, I invite you to uh, join me Monday through Friday on the Smoke Country Jam from 7 a.m. till noon, as well as the Bluegrass Borderline Sunday afternoons at noon till uh, 5 o'clock on WOBLradio.com. Download our free mobile app. You can stay connected to me uh, here on Facebook as well as on our website at wobrradio.com and soon coming Michelle Lee on air.com. Um, again, thank you to Dan Eubanks of Special Consensus, Darren Nicholson of Balsam Range for being my guests. And again, Sammy Passamano behind the scenes and all of you who joined us this evening for Real Talk as we got real with me, Michelle Lee. Until next time, thank you guys. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate thank you, Michelle. Darren, good to good. see you. Love you guys. Good to see you too. Yeah, y'all stay safe out there. And Michelle, thanks for all you do for Bluegrass. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Take care. Later on.